Mm. Hi. Hello. Um, I want to introduce my good friend Ralph, who I have known for quite a long time. And uh, I, I was reflecting on, uh, I was reflecting on how like at our meeting point when we first met and started becoming friends, we were kind of, we were kind of both at this sort of nascent phase of our subsequent sort of paths. I was freshly out of yoga teacher training, Jivukti yoga teacher training. Um, you were starting your path as a meditation teacher, which soon then you, you know, finished your master's and went on to social work and, and uh, therapy and all that stuff. And um, it's been such a joy over the years to kind of like celebrate the unfolding of your career path and all of your um, amazing work and including your amazing first book, Monkey is the Messenger, and, which I love and I read in my classes a lot. Mm. Um, and now we're, um, we're very excited about uh, the second book coming out. Um, which is also really, uh, I feel like, directly authored to me. <laughs> 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 it's called uh, Don't Tell Me to Relax. And it's, uh, well, let me let Ralph say a little bit more about himself and the book, and then we're going to meditate for a second. Sure, sure. And what, I, first of all, uh, uh, I love that um, I thought you were saying hello to me. You were saying hello to the listeners at large. And so um, just classic me to start it off with a, a little bit of uh, social ineptitude. <laughs> we love it. We wanted to hear your voice. So it's and, ah, Thank you. And um, yeah, second of all, how creepy would it have been if I were like, no, actually, Jessica, I did. I wrote the book for you. <laughs> Oh my God, that would be so amazing. I'd be, like, <laughs> I'd be like, the universe is definitely trying to tell me something. <laughs> no, it's just me trying to tell you something. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, the subtitle, Emotional Resilience in the Age of Rage, Feels and Freakouts. Um, it's really, I'll just say before we go into this meditation that we finished the edits and we shipped it off to print um, the week that coronavirus lockdowns began, and we had no idea what was about to happen. And um, here we are in this book that we wrote uh, to be relevant to the election crisis is it's relevant and I mean, it's heartbreaking that it's uh, relevant in all of these ways, but I'm, I'm really actually very glad the book exists to uh, help folks in these times. And so, um, yeah, we can definitely start with uh, a brief meditation practice, um, maybe like three to five minutes. Sounds like perfect. That. Is that cool? Great. So, yeah, let's just get into an appropriate posture. And for anybody listening, um, I'll just say that every body is different and you do what works for you. And if that means you need to lay flat on your back or sit in a chair, that is 100% appropriate and, and good. But arrange your body in a way that feels aligned, that feels supported. And that facilitates the sense of being able to drop in And then dropping in, just notice how this body feels right now. What are the aches and pains and joys and anxieties? That are coursing through you. Let's 
begin by just imagining the sun is shining in the sky. And like it's a really mild day, crisp, clear, bright blue, perfect day. And you're receiving the good sunlight on your face. Or perhaps it feels better to imagine a cool breeze washing across the face. And you feel it on your brow, on your cheeks, on your lips, on your chin, on the bridge of your nose. And the brain doesn't know the difference between imagination and reality. So just let yourself go there. Be like a child standing in the grass, basking. Basking. And then on this day, that good sunlight or that cool breeze, they begin to flow past the skin and into the head and the brain and down into the neck and the throat into the tops of the shoulders and down the arms into the fingers helping everything to just relax and soften surrender Down, down, down into the heart space, down the backbone, and the side body, and the belly. And you can take a few breaths here and just feel that good energy all throughout the torso, the head, the arms. <clears throat> this invitation to let go it's even trickling down into the pelvis and the glutes and the perineum the legs upper legs, knees, lower legs feet and toes, and all the way down into the earth. So that there's a connection of the sunlight or the cool breeze from above, all the way through the body. And plugging into the earth. Now the very last thing here is just to notice and even see if you can get curious about what's shifted in the body, just in these last few minutes. And you open to natural curiosity. About what it is to inhabit this physical vehicle. And in a moment, we'll transition from this very brief practice. But before we do that, 
Can we have an intention to not end the practice, actually? The transition will be opening our eyes and engaging in a different way, but see if you can stay right here. Right where you are now, mentally, emotionally, somatically. As you slowly begin to peel, open the eyes. Take a few breaths. Enter into a so-called normal or <laughs> post-meditation, we should say, state. Yeah. Mm. Nice. That reminds me of um, in your first book, there's like a sun sunlight meditation. Yeah. That's really beautiful. And I've used, uh, I've used uh, as a teaching tool as well before. Um, I really mm -hmm. like it. It's an inviting way to approach the body, especially in the winter months. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Maybe now in the summer months, a little different, but just it's a quick embodiment, uh, a trick. Nice. So I actually, uh, I got on the call feeling a little nervous because I'm not, um, I'm a yoga teacher and I do a lot of yoga teaching all day long and all week long, but I don't do a lot of interviewing. So I was feeling a little um, maybe tense about it or, or maybe even excited about it, but just, you know, hoping, hoping that I can convey my excitement about the book in adequately <laughs> for my listeners. <laughs> well, thank you. And I almost canceled on you because <laughs> I feel a little bit like dog shit right now. I can own that. I didn't sleep well last night. I'm in California yeah. and the wildfires all over the place. Oh, that would be uh, very intense. Incredibly anxious about the election. Yeah. And at the same time, um, uh, I'm grateful for the ability to own all of that and to just have some compassion and curiosity about it in this moment too, without having to shut any of that stuff out, you know? It yeah kind of reminds me of this concept, emotional resiliency. <laughs> I think I heard about that somewhere. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it does, it does remind me of like those times when I've, when I've made a commitment either to go to a yoga class or go to a social gathering or go to therapy or go to whatever. And, and like the, in the minutes before I'm like, I don't want to go, I don't want to do this. What's, can I cancel with any adequate sort of reasoning? And then I go and it actually, those are the moments that I have like the most transformative class or the most, or I, you know, meet some exciting new person or it's like the, the times when I sort of most kind of like retracted uh, internally are the times that I've actually had like the best. Experience. One of the gifts of a compassionate life really Right, like, cause being being of being of service, you know, and then like putting yourself in this situation where you can't cancel and you gotta show up and you gotta like, and you can't really, being a teacher, you can't really fake it either. You gotta figure out how you're going to be honest and heartfelt and genuine. I um, the uh, a morning after the uh, last election, presidential election, I woke up. You know, I'd slept like an hour and a half or something and was crying in bed most of the night and and woke up to Refinery29 <laughs> uh, emailing me like, hey, can you have an emergency interview? We need to like help people deal with their emotions about the election. And I was just like, holy shit, you guys, like, could somebody help me with my emotions <laughs> about the right. election first? But, I remember um, I had to teach all day that day too. And I just... You know, I didn't even stay awake for the, the results. Like once, once I kind of knew, once certain key components became clear, I just like cried myself to sleep. And then I, and then I remembered um, having to teach most of the day the next day. And I just did not have an inspiring bone in my body. I did not have very much 
of any sort of uplifting, encouraging things <laughs> that I felt like I could do, except just be present and get, you know, get through it together. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I think that that's inspiring and uplifting in and of itself, though, right? Just to give people the space to be real. Um, you know, I mean, we could talk about emotional wellness hacks and and tips to reduce anxiety and all of that stuff. But I think what we're what we're getting hip to is that um, that realness over positive vibes, right? Tr truth more than uh, over happiness, even um, is is really uh, is is the true well being actually yeah it's been interesting to sort of um see the the discussions unfold of like how sort of positivity culture can in fact sort of be toxic and um encourage people to sort of repress things or push things aside or um or whatever and and that was that put words to something I was already kind of uh, feeling, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that term toxic positivity that we have now, whoever coined that at like, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. For, uh, yeah, finding a way to describe that, right? That, that uh, very uh, unique form of, of spiritual bypassing, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we'll just go around that. We'll just stuff that. Or, well, or better yet, we'll save it. You know, what really goes on is we'll save it for when I'm behind closed door and maybe I'll uh, take it out on my partner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, oh, yeah, or whoever. Whoever is the emotional punching bag. But, um, yeah. but so the book, I mean, it is, it is kind of confounding to me that this book uh, it was sort of released simultaneous to a worldwide pandemic, right at the cusp of a, a, a new movement, a new uh, sort of incredible step forward for Black Lives Matter, um, uh, and so many other things sort of going on in the world. Like you said, the um, anxiety over the election and the very real um, attempts to suppress uh, voter uh, voter turnout and and um, it, it's kind of astounding because the book the book it, it, it almost feels like it's exactly written for this moment um, and so I'm wondering sort of okay so you must have started writing the book a, a, quite a while ago and yet it feels so relevant <laughs> so how either sort of what was the what was the inspiration for this book in particular and what was happening for you in that moment that gave rise to it even though it feels like it's written for right now yeah yeah well i mean i'll just say quickly that right now what we're seeing i'm still of the the conviction that this is more of an unmasking than it is a sea change for us, and so it's the same. It's the same stuff that's been on heavy rotation. Which just we we're not we're it's intensified, and in such a way that we can't hide from it anymore. But the book was birthed, and and it was written and edited in record time. I wrote the manuscript in two months, and we edited it over the course of four months, and um and then we were we were done. But uh, uh so so it happened very quickly. It was written last year, late last year. And um, and Shambhala Publications actually just came to me and just said, "Hey, would you like to do a, a book on to help people with their emotions? Because we really think that things are going to come to a head with the presidential election in 2020, and we know that meditators and and yogis and and contemplative people are." going to want resources and they're not going to want resources that are preaching acceptance or just how to be with this you know because this is an unacceptable situation um and and the time to meditate pontificate to uh, uh spiritualize it to be anything less than i think the raw and gritty 
actually with with what's going on and, and very real and direct with what's going on you know with that that time is past and i don't know that it's ever going to come back you know in a way i kind of hope we can go back to the bubble <laughs> but i don't think i don't think we will and but i do feel like it is interesting to watch this shift um not not only with your book although your book is certainly a part of it and your teachings are are certainly a part of it um but this this shift that i see sort of happening in 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 lots of places simultaneously throughout spiritual communities like um you know even um uh, lama rod owens who is a favorite of mine came out with you know love and rage recently and it, it does seem just a little, a little extra shout out but um, it does seem like there's a little bit of a shift away from um, sort of the, maybe what you and I were more brought up on, which is the like eradicate your anger, eradicate your fear kind of mentality. I mean, you know, even, even the tradition I was brought up in, you know, free me from anger, jealousy, and fear is sort of in our, our main mm. mantra. And I understand that piece of the mantra differently now than I did then. But I think back then, I really took it to mean, um, you know, let me somehow never experience um, anger, jealousy, and fear again. Right. And I think, I think we're kind of a long way in a development sort of away from or a shift away from sort of like i mean we're a long way from like shanti deva saying like you know speak mildly and don't like one of my favorite lines like don't push furniture around loudly right <laughs> like <laughs> like re recommending this sort of like meekness as an antidote mm -hmm. to anger and this is this is not that mm -hmm. yeah but we're also talking about when we talk about Shanti Day, we're talking about an eighth or ninth century uh, Indian monastic, you know, that we, uh, yeah, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago in the development of Western uh, yoga and Buddhism and what have you, we really thought like, oh, because it was, it's ancient, it's ancient, therefore it's more authentic, it's the real deal. And we're starting to wake up to, oh, no, that that has a context and that context really matters. And that context greatly contrasts from our context. And we need to figure out what these practices look like in our context, which is another piece that we're getting, you know, is that, you know, uh, dropping the cultural appropriation pieces around these practices. The practices themselves are great. Uh, but but to figure out how to excise the cultural trappings that um, are problematic for different reasons, uh, many different reasons. And then to go outside, I'll, I'll, I just want to make sure to touch on something I'm particularly excited about too in the socio-political sphere with Black Lives Matter. Um, I am blown away and so relieved about two things. One, that we're understanding that it has to be a revolution of consciousness as well, that it's not just, it's, it's action and organizing and um, direct support and amplification of voices and protecting marginalized people, yes, but our hearts have to evolve too, otherwise it's, it's, not, gonna, it's not gonna work. And then we're also, there's a big narrative on social media right now around that's so refreshing that began with uh, the uprising after George Floyd uh, died um, or was murdered rather, um, that it can't be performative either. That we can't just do the bare minimum, post a black square and okay, I'm, I'm not a racist, that we have to, that there has to be an active anti-racism, active, anti-oppressive uh, uh, movement within us that we act on, that is woven into our other various daily and weekly uh, rituals and what have you as well. Those two things give me a lot of uh, inspiration. Yeah, so spoiler alert, you do talk about anger in the book. <laughs> 
which, um, which of course I zeroed in on for a couple of reasons. One is that of course this idea about anger is of, of personal interest to my life. Very curious about all that anger stuff. Mm. Um, but I also, oh, and I also, um, it also, I also connect with the, the piece because for me, I've always struggled with how my anger and how my activism and how my spiritual life intersect together. And I find anger to be on the one hand, sometimes a motivating force for my activism, mm -hmm. but then sometimes I'm, but then how, well, let me rephrase that. Okay, let me think about what I want to see here. I guess, I guess my question is, your book touches on, and I think we've also seen with the wonderful, you know, conversation that's been happening around the Black Lives Matter um, uh, movement is, you know, there, there is, first of all, anger is valid and anger, um, you know, doesn't need to be shushed, uh, especially when it's a, a, a justified and um, righteous anger that that needs that needs expression and has been you know unheard for so long, um, and I find that sort of that that sort of ache or yearn for justice has been a motivating factor in my own activism, mm -hmm. and I've also seen the ways in which anger can be destructive to relationships or destructive in, in other, or even self-destructive and destructive in other ways. So I guess my perpetual question is, <laughs> is always like, how do I, how do I discern what's helpful anger and how do I re, um, habituate or re, educate or, or stay away from the anger that might not be so, you know, helpful or, or move me in the right direction. Like, how do you, how do you start to parse that out and what, and at what point, uh, anyway. Yeah. Cause, cause again, like we kind of grew up with that, like Buddhist teaching of like, you know, get, get angry at your anger and don't stand for, you know, cause if you're habituating, if you're habituating any, mood of anger in yourself, then it's just going to come out in, in all directions. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, there's, this is such a juicy and complex and very layered topic. I could give you five different answers. And, um, you know, when I was working with parents and children in, um, in Harlem in a community mental health clinic, one of um, one of the conversations I often had myself uh, uh, found myself having with uh, parents um, was it's okay to hate your kids, <laughs> and parents would you know get defensive and say you know of course I don't what kind of parent do you think I am you know and no 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 like that six year old of yours is kind of a nightmare and I can only imagine what it's like to be at home with them and can we talk about how you sometimes hate them please because if you don't admit it it's if you admit it great we can work with it we can figure out how you're going to cope with and manage you know that and but if you don't admit it that's when those feelings go underground they're absorbed into our body in so many ways that come out through speech be belief and and behavior then we got a problem but if we can talk about it no problem you know we can um, but to actually answer your question, here's the succinct version. Is compassion in the mix or has anger totally eclipsed us? Com can compassion, can we, so, so um, for those of, of you who are just listening to the audio and can't see what I'm doing, I'm bringing my two hands together right and clasping them and like it's like here's anger this one hand and and this other 
hand is me. And what usually happens is when anger comes in, boom, and we even talk like this, I, I'm angry. Right? That's how identified we become with the emotion. But it's completely possible to take these two hands apart and put a little bit of daylight between them. And this is where meditation really comes in and take just one step back, not get rid of the anger, but take one step back so that it's less like I'm angry and more like I feel anger or an angry part of me is really activated right now. And then here with this other hand, this hand is now free to find at least some curiosity or to at least remember our values <laughs> like love and wakefulness, you know? And this is a much better situation. We can, we can, uh, in this situation, we can take this anger and let it inform um, uh, what we think, say, and do next without having to be in that intoxicated state where we just want to be right, we just want revenge, we, you know, we start having thoughts about what other people deserve and how we're the ones to deliver it to them, <laughs> you know. Um, it's very, very different if we can I've break. Heard, I've heard that anger feels like a very um, intense emotion. I wouldn't know myself, but... Um, That's not you yoga <laughs> You don't get that shit away, right? <laughs> no, but but often anger feels like such an emergency. Like mm -hmm. it, it's literally like an emergency level experience um, for me. I mean, not that I've experienced anger, but um, it's such an emergency level experience that it's so hard to find that one glimmer sometimes of like, how can I ask? For space or how can I take a step back or how can I revisit this later because you're just boiling you know you're you're just simmering there yeah so yeah. How, how do you get from how do you get from completely enmeshed with the emotion to just having that first little like let's count to ten moment <laughs> yeah I mean the same way you get to Carnegie Hall right practice <laughs> You know, really, because um, the first the first step is really awareness is is recognizing that that you're pissed off, and that's actually the hardest step is to like recognize like okay, I'm angry and I need to stop. I in fact, if we're pissed off, we have to stop. We have to. There's nothing you can do in a state of anger. If you're if you if you're in this what we call a blended state with that angry part of you. Um, there's nothing you can do that won't create more harm or won't create more suffering for yourself and others. So you, we, we, we have an a, a imperative as conscious people to stop and to figure out how to get that space. So I guess part two of that question is, is definitely like, how do we... <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to spend our whole, whole entire time on anger, although. Do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I guess, is there also a way like, um, I guess I'm tempted to not uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater um, mm -hmm. or, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the way that things, um, teachings and teachers, it can stay valuable to us even as we evolve and change and grow. I'm not, terribly into cancel culture or anything. So I'm not looking to like cancel Shanti Deva, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and I guess I guess is there is there a way to all, to take wisdom from both, you know, fr from both sort of the, this new wave of um, spirituality and meditation practice and take wisdom from Shanti Deva and kind of kind of navigate both practices simultaneously? I don't know. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I talk about this in the intro to the book, right? It's like a, like a new paradigm of, of emotional awareness, of emotional intelligence, moving out of a static paradigm, which is like this notion that I'm a solid self 
And, you know, if I'm angry, that's the only game in town. And starting to recognize that, no, it's layered. You know, like uh, right now on this call, I am slightly hungover, definitely underslept, anxious, a little bit freaked out about the wildfires being about 20 miles away from me right now. Um, grateful for this wonderful house that I'm in, grateful for my privilege and good fortune, happy to see you, you know, <laughs> uh, worried about the election, R really excited about, you know, the opportunity to work with people and to teach and, and to continue being a therapist in these crazy times. And um, all of those things can coexist in the exact same moment. I just had a big aha moment as you were describing that. Um, Tell me. Just that, uh, is that what you mean when you talk about blend, being blended in the book? I, I mean, yes, that for the first example, the static yeah. paradigm of yeah. like anger comes in and yeah. Yeah, and I just had this, I just had this sort of flash of awareness of like how sort of simplistically we relate to our emotional content on a day-to-day -day basis. Like if you ask me how I'm feeling, I usually go, oh, I'm sad. Oh, I'm tired. I'm grouchy. But I, it's kind of like this. It, it's so limited even in the way I talk to myself about my emotional content. Whereas when I really think about it, it's more like what you're describing. Like I'm, I'm, I'm feeling this sort of multitude of things all at once, you know. Which is actually promising, even though we're yeah. talking about distressing and uncomfortable, you know, and even devastating things to um, hold within us. It's actually promising because it means we're not stuck. We're not stuck there. We are really uh, a river more than, uh, you know, a stagnant pool of water. Yeah, certainly, certainly these days I've been trying to make more of a, more of a practice of like noticing small joys or small delights like in, mm. Pema Drone has some good stuff about this and less so of a gratitude journal because I struggle a little bit with the sort of mainstream idea of like gratitude practice or whatever, but um, uh, that's a different story for a different time. But I have been trying to kind of like be more mindful when I'm noticing a, like a lovely thing in the yard or the taste of a, of a meal that I've prepared for myself or like noticing these sort of sort of delightful or precious moments. And that gives me that sense of this multifaceted experience that we're all having and struggling through at, at the moment. Yeah, yeah. No, human life is still precious. The fact that we're here is still important. And there is beauty and wonder around us at all times. And we can, and in fact, I think now more than ever, and, and especially when and if things amplify, more is going to become of increasing importance that we literally stop and smell the flowers that we literally you know look each other in the eye and oh my god a moment of of actually connecting <laughs> you know uh that yeah yeah it our brains have a negativity bias we know this uh, we are hardwired to uh, uh notice more frequently and with more intensity um, the negative things that are happening. And so we have that skewed uh, perception of, of things as well that we can consciously, in, in knowing that, we can consciously rebalance it. And that's what I hear you saying, you're doing for yourself. It's consciously Just, about being fails. Yeah, making it up as I go, but thanks. Um. <laughs> <laughs> So, so somewhat, um, somewhat connected to sort of my question about Sh Shantideva or how we kind of like, how we kind of integrate the old with the new. Um, I'm, I'm also, I'm also curious about your spiritual path because we've known each other for a, a number of years and I, I've sort of observed you over the years and whereas I have, I have sort of been with my teachers for a long time and kind of do what I do. And I, it, it, my practice and my training and experience has been sort of more monolithic. Um, <laughs> I, 
whereas I've seen you, you have such an exploratory spiritual experience. You've been with different communities and different teachers and um, tried different methods and different paths. And, um, you know, whereas I think, I feel like, I feel like in my younger years, my judgmental mind might have seen that and thought like, oh, well, he's just noncommittal or he just can't like settle on something or, he, you know, it's like this spiritually shopping or, you know, whatever. But, but actually, um, I think what resonates for me now um, is how integrated sort of every, everything I've watched you experience that like, comes together in your writings and in your books and how, how sort of like heart filled and how sort of, um, let me, let me try that again. <laughs> I guess sometimes, I guess sometimes I assume that people who have had sort of many different teachers and many different practices that maybe they're like disillusioned with practices or disillusioned with teachers or disillusioned with this, but instead of a sense of disillusionment, instead what I get is this sense of sort of like this like heart filled, warm, welcoming, like bringing all of the good parts of practice and all the beauty of spiritual life together in, in your voice and in your, and in your books. Yeah, I know. I mean, I wish I, I envy you. <laughs> Actually, I mean, you have fantastic teachers. I've seen you uh, develop into like such a refined and uh, precise yoga teacher. I haven't had the pleasure of taking one of your Friday night classes. Well, I guess many of us have not. No one has. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's been a while since I've practiced in the same room with you, but, but um, there's, there's value in uh, what Jack Cornfield calls uh, digging a deep, one deep well as, as opposed to a bunch of shallow holes. And, um, and that, would, that works for a lot of people. I, I don't know if I'm restless or just insatiably curious, probably both, and then just... Um, I know that I need the sampler platter of practices to keep me sane. I, I know that I need um, wisdom from all, as many sources as I can get it. And I really see how it's all really about the same thing. There is a, a level where even now that, um, so I wasn't going to talk about this, but like I, I, I've gotten into snowboarding and um, and and a little bit of uh, free running, and I'm I, I really want to audition for the television show American Ninja Warrior next year, <laughs> which is uh, because it'd be so amazing to get on national TV as a trauma survivor and an ex heroin addict and somebody who's just really been in the gutter and say like, yo, I'm in my 40s, I've never really been an athlete, and you know, but like I've turned my life around and um, that's possible for all of us. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's another place where I'm actually finding a lot of the same wisdom. Uh, because it's all how you meet challenges and how you work with pain and fear and how do you embody tenacity and these things. So, yeah. yeah, right before the pandemic, I was getting really into Kung Fu and I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, like it's, it's yoga, but just more with faster movements. <laughs> but I was getting, I was sort of seeing the teachings come through in a, in a different sort of setting or whatever. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's there even just in going for a hike or, you know, um, hmm. What's something that seems explicitly non-spiritual where we can find <laughs> um, where we can find um, some good a political rally? <laughs> I mean, so so what we've been referencing, or what I've been referencing, really, with the emotional intelligence piece and how we can bring to uh, compassion to even 
emotions as intense as anger is this notion that there's an inner household, that we are one heart with many parts, uh, that just as we have one body, but it's made of so many different parts, uh, it, why would it be different with our psyches, you know? And, um, you know, there, so, so that insight that, as Walt Whitman said, you know, I contain multitudes, uh, that there's an inner community inside of me. And that's that layered and fluid piece that we were just talking about. Um, there's, there's an inner outer thing with how we show up at a political rally, right? Like how compassionate am I towards myself? How much do I listen to myself? You know, has a direct correlation to what kind of energy do I bring when I'm marching on the streets? What kind of, of, of presence of mind do I have when taking in voices of marginalized people or people that I don't agree with necessarily or people who are calling me out and making me feel defensive mm -hmm. you know there's an inner and outer um reflection that is actually very direct when we start to consider that within me there's also a community there's actually a mini society uh within me and um what a great opportunity that creates in meditation practice to practice how we're going to uh, show up in the world. You brought up, you brought up something that, um, you know, getting, getting defensive in the face of feedback. I mean, it's a, Woo. it's, it's such a, a human reaction. And uh, I mean, of course, that's our first, our first instinct is to sort of put our defenses up when we're hearing some difficult feedback um, from the world. And that can also feel like an emergency level event sometimes. And I think um, uh, like it's interesting to sort of watch that, that, that emergency arise where you feel like you're gonna die a little bit, right? Um, and how important it is in especially especially now, but always, but especially now, to be able to sit with the discomfort of getting feedback from your peers or even from someone you don't even necessarily know. Um, yeah. And then being able to sit with that without reacting defensively. Which is, for me, harder than anger, actually. I, I know I have been guilty of just shutting down those conversations with, nope. Didn't mean that. Nope. Uh, you know, re I'm, I, I have a history with drug addiction, which means I am an expert at rationalizing. And so I can rationalize anything away, you know, in the face of being uh, called on my shit. Um, I, there's a chapter on call outs in the book that um, because I'm so historically bad at dealing with it and wanted to learn about it, um, uh, I invited uh, somebody to, I, I, I interviewed um, uh, this man, uh, uh, Aaron Rose, um, because uh, he was offering a lot of uh, workshops at the time on call outs and call ins and navigating conflict on social media and what have you. And I ended up basically like almost verbatim printing the entire interview uh, because it was so good. And something that he said that's super simple and very practical and so helpful um, is all you've got to say back, especially if it's online, is thank you so much, I'm going to sit with that. And then you can privately step away and you don't even know that person responds for at least that buys you like a few days. And you can go through your own thing before you respond to whatever has been mentioned to you. For me, the first thing is like, no, screw you, pal. I'm right. This is why. But if I stay with it, eventually I can actually hear what's being said and I can think about the other person and their context and what's informing it. So what I'm hearing, though, is that the key is when you step away, you don't spend that time contemplating how to better craft your answer. You spend that time contemplating like, how, what makes what the other person said feel right and what makes, and what were they actually trying to communicate to me? And you, you spend time 
gooing with it rather than thinking like, oh, how can I like better rework my response? <laughs> right, yeah, how can we move those chess pieces forward and get them, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> what's the cleverest thing I can say? Yeah, um, well, I mean, but just to quickly say, well, for one, I just want to own that, you know, I don't love this about myself, but it seems to be the habitual reaction of that. No, I do that for about half a day. And then I start to soften from there. Because the, it's, it's, it's tough because it's vulnerable. It's vulnerable AF to <laughs> uh, not be right, to admit we're wrong, to admit that our conditioning has failed us in some way, or that our intellectualism has failed us in some way, that we don't have a complete view after all. That's actually to own that and to and to be thrust into that position publicly. Very, very vulnerable, and we are hardwired to, at first, at least, defend to fight back against that vulnerability. And so, yeah, taking some space. <laughs> I, yeah. I even, I mean, I find like. I find Facebook to be an emotional roller coaster, so I'm trying to be a little smarter about how I use it. But um, but I've also taken a practice. I I think I think it was from you. I think maybe a few years ago you mentioned that you, you like you don't answer even emails after a certain hour or something like that. Um, mm. just, just to get because because you know, in the evening, like you've had this big long day, your brain is full, your heart is full, you're hungry, you're tired, you want a right. glass of wine. And then that email comes in and it's like, your response is probably the grouchiest one, right? right. <laughs> so, so what I've been doing is I, I think, I think something you said made me try this, but I've been waiting like, like after work hours, even if it's, a more personal email or you know when, if, when you're a freelancer it's very hard to make those boundaries because mm. you feel like you have to be available all the time but if it's like after a certain hour I try not to respond like until I can get to it during a business hour right yeah yeah no I take like five days to respond to emails and I'm a little <laughs> bit apologetic about it <laughs> I'm with clients I'm in session man but um <laughs> It's true. But um, also, I don't debate anybody online anymore. I refuse. I have moments of backsliding with that, but like, nope, not happening. If somebody puts a White Lives Matter or whatever on my Instagram, delete, block, done. Not here. Not today. My house, my rules. I don't have to tolerate that. And I don't, I don't have to tolerate it and allow my friends to see it be triggered by it. I see this so many all over the place where yeah. somebody will just like casually drop a white lives matter. And then there's like six progressives, like doing the emotional labor of like, please educate yourself, blah, blah, blah. And the common threads and arguing with this person. It's like, yo, we have way better places to invest this kind of energy. No one's changing each other's minds online right now. So no. true. Yeah. So true. Yeah. Um, uh, you also talk uh, in, in the book you have some suggestions about self love and self care and what that means and uh, I love that topic <laughs> 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 because well again just to go back to uh, you know just to kind of go back to how things have changed over the years seems to be the kind of theme of this interview unintentionally but um you know, back in the day, <laughs> it feels like there was more, at least in the communities you and I were, um, were hanging around in, it seemed like there was more of a focus on selfless service and on like doing good all over the place and doing it anonymously and, you know, and like how happiness can, can come about from, from doing so much good for others. Yeah. And, and for me, um, for me, I was attracted to that notion for a couple of reasons. One is being a, being an activist myself, I thought, oh, this aligns perfectly with my already deeply held belief that action 
that helps other people can produce happiness, right? And then it also aligns with this other deeply held, uh, well, it's not really a belief, but a deeply held pattern of, of codependency. Mm. And a feeling, like, a feeling like if I just do enough for others and give enough of myself, that that will produce happiness, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then we see this sort of pendulum. Well, I'm going to pause there for a moment. The, when, then we see this pendulum swing, which is now like the focus is on self care and self love and all this, uh, you know, kind of kind of over the top, like to where like self love i hear i hear more about self-love on instagram than i hear about sort of i start i wanted to start a hashtag called like other care as opposed to self-care and like like yeah. like take care of others once a day you know yeah. um but that could also you see someone looking at those teachings could also distort them to sort of suit their already deeply held beliefs and systems and so how how does someone like how, how do, is there an extreme? Is there, too, is it possible to have too much self-love, self-care or too much other care? I know the answer to that one. And then, um, and then how do we, and then how do we protect ourselves from sort of funneling into our all, already comfortable category and living in that form of the teaching? How do we find like a balance between them? Yeah. Simple answer, heal your trauma. Heal your trauma that is at the core of that codependent paradigm where we mistake altruism for, you know, having no boundaries, depleting yourself, what Shogun Chung Pavarin Pichet called idiot compassion, you know, <laughs> like it's really, that's, that's, that's the, for me, the root cause is like, is, is having a lot of wounds that are untended to and the way to tend to those wounds is with love and self-compassion. And in this way, both sides of that coin, self and other. But then what about the other side of the spectrum? The person who comes in and is like, oh, well, I just have to be kind to myself and it's all about being kind to myself. And, and then anything that's uncomfortable or challenges that, or like even the discomfort of, being confronted by your friend or your whatever online, then that becomes like, oh, well, this is uncomfortable for me, so. Yeah, you're crossing my boundaries. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine, a t even though I'm very much on one side of the spectrum, I can imagine the other side of the spectrum that becomes like, oh, well, anything uncomfortable isn't, doesn't feel safe and doesn't feel kind to myself, and so therefore I'm gonna, yeah, I would I would just say that 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 in that hypothetical situation that I have never been in. Um <laughs> Yeah, I would say that um that hypothetical person is working with an incomplete concept of self-love. That that is one side of the coin, but self-love is actually gritty and tenacious and willing to go to the shadows, willing to work with raw, tender, fearsome material and get down in the dirt with it. Yeah. Right, you have that beautiful line about, um, about tenacity, about like a tender tenacity, mm -hmm. um, which really resonated with me because sometimes Sometimes I have to check in with the voice in my head saying like, yeah, it's cool. You've worked really hard. Just take a meme day and lay on the couch and look at me. <laughs> That's, yeah. you know, self-care. Um, yeah. And the part of me that's like, well, no, self-care also involves like, you know, doing your taxes and, you know, uh, cl cleaning up the yard and working on your laundry and getting like, you know, there's that kind of self-care too. And, um, and so we have to be very cautious, I find, with the voice in the head that's like, no, you deserve this. It's time to just rest. And that voice is sometimes right. Um, but let me say this too, though, because if we're doing 
selfless service right, which for me means getting curious about my own maybe reactions about having to go to work when I'm tired or like if I've got something personally going on, I get curious about that in me. And that curiosity, that spark of curiosity allows me to get curious about other people. And like, I cannot tell you, and you spoke to this earlier, how many times um, I just don't, don't want to show up for a class or for even seeing clients, but the moment I'm there, if I can get into that curious mindset, it's not long before that curiosity develops into like true heartfelt compassion and concern and, and love. And that is where self-love and other love, self-care and other care uh, really integrate. And I, I, I would not be okay right now if I wasn't living a life of service. I, I wouldn't be. In, the, in, in this, you know, social context, forget it. I would feel like, a, I don't know. I, I, just, I just don't think I would be as happy as, or, or um, as flexible as emotionally and cognitively flexible if it wasn't for the opportunity to be with others in their, those dark places. This is the last thing I'll say, is because I go to those dark places with people and because my life is altru altruistically centered, what that means is that my free time is amazing because then I can have that day on the couch the beach vacation, whatever it is, and really savor it because mm -hmm. I'm nourishing the vessel that then shows up for others. I think that that's a recipe for a really beautiful life, actually. That's really beautiful. So, so I'm hearing that like the, the more present you are with people the more the more you're able to care for yourself even though you're in i mean you are you know you're a, 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 a keeper of people's you know mental well-being <laughs> and yeah. emotional well-being and that that in itself could you know could lead most people to a pretty high level of stress and burnout themselves but that you're that your self-care actually ends up being a product of how present you are in your I'm, work. Yeah, I'm able to enjoy it because I've done my part. I've done my piece, you know? And now when it's me time, I know that it's actually, that becomes part of the altruism. Mm. If I don't really thoroughly nourish myself, if I don't have a really high quality of life, forget it. I'm not going to be able to hold space like that. You know, and so in this way, it sets up. Um, I don't know. I just have this image right now of like, of two buckets that keep pouring the water back and forth into one another. Oh, right. I like that. Yeah, I like that, and that image actually might help me to suss out kind of like where I am if I if I can just kind of like listen in, like how full are the two buckets respectively <laughs> which one do, which one needs a little bit more <laughs> yeah i mean i i did the 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 full on selfless service thing and it was awful it was miserable it was not sustainable you know from a, a monastic context to a social work context you know yeah I, I, did that idiot compassion thing of like I'm a superhero I can just keep going keep going and and it's just I can't think about me that's quote unquote ego self trips well, yeah ego uh, oh the evil ego a big bad ego <laughs> <laughs> so bad for having an ego hogwash so can I can I read a, a passage that I just read a, uh, a little bit before we hopped on the call I'm gonna read yeah. you writing back to you. <laughs> We all hurt and we all heal. It is what we are born to do. Resilience is intrinsic to all living organisms. So 
I, I love that because it just reminds us that um, resiliency and the ability to heal and the ability to grow is part of our makeup. It's part of just being an, an organism. It's part of being a being. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, and it, it made me remember, it sort of reminded me that I sort of also fell into a little bit of a, a little bit of a trap in my own practice where I, where I kind of went down the, if it's, if it's uncomfortable, it will necessarily lead to growth route. And so I was doing things in <laughs> practice and in, and especially in my relationships that were, that were uncomfortable, but I thought, well, the more I put myself in this uncomfortable situation, the more I'll grow from it or I'll be bigger, better, stronger. And unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I ended up in, you know, getting completely emotionally steamrolled and engaging in some like self denial and some denial of my own like needs and boundaries. And on top of it, I end up ended up doing sort of like other people's emotional work for them and kind of like it was a disaster so now <laughs> question is question is like both in practice and in our i mean i think relationships are practice and practice you know yeah absolutely what for if not for our relationships with others you know but but, you know, for those of us that have um, a special relationship to pain and discomfort, as you can see etched on my entire body, yeah. um, how do we distinguish or how do we keep ourselves in that sweet spot between like experiencing uncomfortable things or like in your case, you know, pushing ourselves athletically or intellectually or artistically or in our relationships, but without sort of um, going to that extreme of like, like, well, I've just got to push through no matter what. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine if you did asana practice eight hours a day, every day? Like, what would happen? Like, injury, right? I went through that phase. Popping tendons. Yeah. Yeah, but you would, I mean, so, I mean, this is a total, totally ableist uh, kind of example, but, you know, I'm, I, I'm trying to learn how to do backflips right now. <laughs> like, I don't know why that's a life goal of mine, but it is. It's totally ridiculous. I want to be able to do a backflip. And so I'm doing a ton of box jumps and a lot of handstanding and a lot of core work and um, all of that stuff. But understand that the workout, what a workout does or what an asana practice does is it actually injures you. That's, that's actually on purpose, it injures you. It tears the muscle fibers of your body, right? It, it stretches out ligaments and joints and what have you, and it puts them in a compromised position. You know, if I, get, if I go to the gym and I lift a bunch of weights for an hour and a half, my arms are going to be at their weakest after that workout, not their strongest. And the way that, that uh, we build strength, and this is true physically and psychologically and emotionally and spiritually, which is why I'm okay with using this able-bodied example, is it applies to all of us. But it's one way where you can look at how the process of resilience and how it's a good thing, right? It's good to work out, but the workout actually makes you weaker unless you recover properly. But strength is actually build, built when we rest and recover and we you know, eat the right foods and, and drink enough water and all of that stuff after we dropped in what in strength training that we call the stressed stimulus of the workout. And um, that's, that's how we grow physically. That's how we grow immature uh, interpersonally as well in relationships, right? We have conflicts and blow ups and moments of fuck it, I'm out of here. <laughs> Get me away from this crazy person. And then we come back and we process and we discuss and we come to new understandings of each other. We set new rules and boundaries, you know, and uh, relationships can grow through the stress stimulus of conflict too. Mm. 
and this is this is um, you know, meditation. Same thing. Meditation can be so painful. So oh. much drama. Please, yeah. So what that makes me think of is what that makes me think of is that um, even in sort of nor um, I don't want to say normal, but even in sort of just co conflict that is experienced in some relationships, that that it might be helpful even to have like a particular process for that recovery period like maybe like mm -hmm. taking some space revisiting in a neutral environment like having a uh you know a period where we like listen to each other but not um interrupt or defend or sort of having some sort of like um uh package or some sort of like way in which to sort of recover as it were so it just yes. doesn't feel kind of like undone or something. Yeah. I mean, just hearing you say that, I'm reminded of, you know, kind of this fundamental truth that we think that life is linear and we think that people are rational and uh, neither of those things are true at all. <laughs> that, that things move in seasons and we're very feelings based. You know, but like to let your life be like a like a, a sine wave, a nice even wave of like now I'm up here and I'm doing this, and now I'm down here and I'm doing that, and just just let it um, al allow for conflict, allow for difficulty, allow for stress, allow for these things, and then to spend time recovering from them, and then get back in the ring, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and like that. Again, we're back at the two buckets. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, interpersonal relationships are definitely the master class. They are, for me, they're definitely the final frontier. Oh, God. <laughs> I definitely, um, I think we're all challenged by intimacy. So I, uh, I have, I'm sure you hear people's meditation confessions all the time because I know I do as a yoga teacher. I just basically, basically half my job is just listening to people's yoga confessions and meditation confessions. They say like, Oh, I haven't practiced in four days. I'm like, honey, let me tell you when my best friend died, I didn't practice for six months. Don't worry. You know, no. Like these things happen. <laughs> um, but you know, but the meditation confession is usually like, oh, I haven't been meditating as much as I should. And, mm -hmm. uh, oh, I, I really want to meditate, but I just, I, I just can't make it happen. Blah, blah, blah. And, um, and in, in this book, you, you mention just like, just kind of reworking what you think meditation is and just letting yourself think instead of thinking it has to be some other kind of way. And just being curious about the thoughts rather than like, I saw on Facebook someone the other day posting about like negating the thoughts or something. And I was like, no, that's not, that's not really it. Um, like how it, it's impossible. No one can do it. And if no one can do it. Then why would, would we even try? I mean, you know, anyway, yeah. I'm getting off topic, but it, um, so you recommend kind of allowing just a curiosity about the thoughts as as an approach mm -hmm. and um oh no now i lost my train of thought because i thought about that facebook thing <laughs> maybe meditation confessions meditation confessions Getting to something about the other book because in the other book you have a really um helpful oh in the <laughs> other book i remember I remember in the other book, in the other book, you, you, I think you suggest like, instead of thinking about how you should be meditating and you really should have meditated and why didn't you meditate, spend that time thinking about all the benefits that would arise um, as a result of meditation. So if you, if you think about all of the positives and you think about the future self that meditates and how and how that works for you and and how amazing it is that that's 
sort of more effective than getting into a whole like, well, I should be, but I'm not. And I failed again today and I'll fail again tomorrow and all that dialogue that we do. Yeah. What I call staying close to your why. And think about why, not the what you should be doing, but just why. Uh, here's, here's a funny confession for you. I've got a yoga confession. <laughs> Since, since you've opened up space for it. No, back, back in the day, uh, when, when my asana practice was first really taking root and I would slip um, for a couple of days and not practice, one of the really dumb, absurd things that I would do was I would buy a yoga journal. Like they would have it at the, at the, at the subway newsstands um, on my way home, I was waiting cables in the Upper East Side at the time, and I would buy a copy of Yoga Journal, just knowing that it's, it's pro so problematic and so, I, I don't know. But, uh, um, and, and, and I would just like look at these pictures and be like, oh my God, I want to learn how to do that with my body. Oh, I want to try this breathing practice. Oh, I want to, you know? Oh, yeah. And then the next thing I knew, I'd be back on, on the daily thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. So for those of us who don't want to buy a yoga journal, you could like flip open like an Iyengar book and like look at some inspiring asanas and be like, wow, cool. Mm. How good do I feel when I've done some back bends? I feel so energized. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. A great. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah, for me these days, I look at people doing backflips on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. Um, I try to stay away from yoga on Instagram, but you know, that's, di mm -hmm. that's different. But, um, oh, so, so, okay. So now tell us everything we need to know about the how and the where and the what of the book. How do mm -hmm. we get it? Where do we get it? How soon can we get it? Mm. Yeah. So um, at the time of this recording, it comes out in five days. Um, so, and it's available wherever books are sold right now, um, with, you know, the way things are, I really strongly request that everybody buys the book directly from Shambhala Publications, um, which is not to be confused with Shambhala International, by the way, the now defamed uh, religious organization, um, totally separate situation, but, um, Shambhala Publications, Shambhala.com, um, the book is called Don't Tell Me to Relax. Um, it is available other places, Barnes and Noble and, and other bigger uh, carriers. And um, wh when is this podcast coming out? It's actually coming out, out about a week from today, so. Oh, cool. Oh yeah, cool. so it'll be out by the time you hear this. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be out and there's some, <coughs> excuse me, some book launch events that um, are just, if you just look at Ralph De La Rosa on Instagram or, um, or, or Facebook for that matter, not so big on the Twitter, but um, uh, those are widely announced. Um, I'm also doing a workshop series with a whole, whole bunch of different venues called Resilience Club. That, um, and the idea is, is you know, we're, we're doing things on self-love and social justice. There'll be a, a, a day-long retreat on anti-racist, doing internal anti-racist work, uh, finding the racist parts of ourselves and uh, holding them with compassion so that we can undo that conditioning. Um, the, uh, and the idea is, is that there's gonna be monthly workshops for a little while because we are walking into this election we don't know what's on the other side of it. And I want to create kind of a thread where people can, um, yeah, have resources on both sides of that door. And then there's a whole bunch of other online courses such as Redefining Self-Love is coming up. Um, uh, that's just my own private uh, online courses. But yeah, if you, ralphdelarosa.com to get on the mailing list, Ralph De La Rosa on Instagram uh, uh, to, to to stay current. Yeah, and I'll post all about all that stuff too so that people can easily find Ralph if you're, uh, you know, if you're coming through me, I'll make it really easy to find uh, Ralph. I'm really excited for the book and for all of my students, just get ready because just like when the last book came out, I'm gonna be reading from it like every day because I could just read every passage from it is like a class. <laughs> oh. 
thank you so much. I really, yeah, I appreciate your appreciation. And so good to see you good too. Good to see you and too. So good to just like that. I haven't hung out for this long in, in a few years. I, I know, it seems like that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well. Well. Let's see.